Without the pooter, you don't have life in the area. He used the river water to irrigate the farm. In my time, it was my lifestyle that I could come down here and play as a kid. The Poudre River is absolutely the lifeblood of northern Colorado. From its headwaters at 12,000 feet in the Rocky Mountains, the Cache La Poudre River snakes its way through rugged mountain terrain to the fertile plains of northern Colorado, turning a once desolate expanse into a thriving region of agriculture and urban activity. Waters from the Cache La Poudre feed the farmland that once dominated this area along the river and now help quench the thirst of a growing population. It's a small river, but it holds a rich heritage dating back many centuries. It played a key role in the development of water law in the U.S., the development of modern water delivery systems, and it was the source of a bitter dispute between the communities of Fort Collins and Greeley that nearly erupted into war. This is the Cache La Poudre River National Heritage Area. The upper stretches of the Cache La Poudre River that originate at Poudre Lake, high on Rocky Mountain National Park, have been set aside by Congress as part of the wild and scenic system of rivers to preserve its free flow and natural beauty. But just miles below, peacefully traversing a 40-mile stretch of northern Colorado plains. The river lies at the heart of decades of legal and political struggle. These struggles, however, led to the development of today's water law of the western United States and to advances in water delivery systems now found throughout the country. In 1996, the U.S. Congress recognized these unique and significant contributions to our national heritage of cultural and historic lands, waterways, and structures, and designated the lower corridor of the river as a national heritage area, the first of its kind west of the Mississippi. This section of the Cache La Poudre River, known as the Working Cache, begins in Larimer County at the eastern edge of the Roosevelt National Forest and ends at the confluence with the South Platte River east of Greeley and is responsible for the settlement, agriculture, and growth of the region. The river's name dates back to the early French trappers that first settled the river basin in the 1840s. According to legend, a group in the area was caught in a heavy snowstorm. To lighten their load, they buried their gunpowder near the river and from that point on called the river Hide the Powder, or in French, Cache la Poudre. While the hunters and trappers along the river had little need for agriculture, the 1859 discovery of gold in Denver sparked a dramatic influx of settlers. Farmers took to the fertile soils along the Cache la Poudre and soon began digging the first primitive irrigation ditches in the 1860s. I think about how they were able to come in here and take the first ditches off of the river, which were not very far from the Taylor and Gill, which was one of the first. You know, they, they had to do a lot of work. And they took that water for miles and miles. These first efforts at controlling the water resulted in the first water management law passed by the territorial legislature in 1861. The law authorized local communities to appoint commissioners who were to apportion water in a just and equitable proportion. The vague law stood until irrigation methods improved and demand for water surpassed the river's supply. But the primitive ditches proved vital to the growing river basin. Though short and simple, the early irrigation methods watered crops of corn, beans, alfalfa, potatoes, beets, and more. Even today, the ditches continue to provide irrigation vital to the farms in the area. All of our ditches were, of course, uh, were not cement ditches, and we had to scoop those out or shovel them out every spring so that we got all the weeds and trash and everything out of them so we would have a free run of water. And so there was always a big thing in the spring as we had to shovel ditch. There was a real science to that, of turning your shovel, filing your shovel just right, having it at the edge just sharp enough 
and then approaching the side of the ditch and scouring it. So it was, and you, this was a skill that was taught to you and you did it right and then it made it go a lot easier. In 1870, the Union Colony was settled near the confluence of the Cashlapooter and the South Platte, later to become the town of Greeley. This farming community quickly changed the nature and scale of irrigation in Northeast Colorado by building two canal-sized cooperative ditches, serving an unprecedented number of farmers, as well as the needs of the growing municipality. These were called the Greeley No. 2 and No. 3. The colony's membership fees funded the ditches, and all male residents of an eligible age were enlisted to help in their construction. This irrigation has gone on to serve the family farming community for generations people did not farm very big or very large farms because they simply couldn't do that many acres uh, when you have to do it all by hand. Further upstream from the Union Colony, another community was established along the Cashlapooter in 1873 called the Fort Collins Agricultural Colony. Soon, the Lake Canal was built, a large ditch that diverted water to irrigate the new Fort Collins farmland. The following year brought drought to the river basin. Water levels in the river lowered, and the downstream Union Colony saw most of its water being diverted to Fort Collins farmers. Tempers flared as the summer wore on. Finally, to avert an all-out water war, representatives from the two communities met at the Eaton School near Windsor in July of 1874 to settle the conflict. Union colonists demanded recognition of their 1870 prior claim to water. Fort Collins farmers wanted a water commissioner to divide water according to the greatest need. Eventually, a settlement was reached. Fort Collins agreed to reduce water use to allow more water to flow to Greeley. Heavy rains eased the drought and temporarily diffused the situation. The issues raised during the conflict sowed the seeds of what would become the foundation of Colorado water law. It took more conflicts along the Cache Lapooter and other Colorado waterways for the doctrine to take root. The next major standoff involved future Colorado Governor Benjamin Eaton and his Larimer and Weld Canal, located upstream from both Greeley and Fort Collins. As construction began in 1878 on Eaton's massive ditch, downstream communities quickly realized the potential of the canal to divert the entire river. Farmers looked to the newly formed state of Colorado for laws to define and protect property rights. The resulting legislation gave shape to the prior appropriation doctrine that still serves as a foundation for today's Colorado water law. In 1876, the Cash Laputa River Basin saw the construction of the area's first water storage structure. There are numerous, numerous lakes and reservoirs here that were built by the people that had the foresight to see what was going on. So when we run out of this snow melt now, we go to what we call a reservoir water, and this is the water that is stored, and this takes us through the, the rest of the season, basically in through September. By the close of the 19th century, there were nearly 40 reservoirs in the Cache Lapooter water system. At the same time, communities in the river basin joined forces and went to the mountains for more water. With great difficulty in the harsh terrain and high altitude along the Continental Divide, a series of trans-mountain diversions were constructed. In the Pooter Basin, we've got uh, several types of uh, water that comes from different basins. For an example, uh, we've got the Laramie Pooter Tunnel that delivers water from the Laramie River. We've got the Grand River Ditch that diverts water from the Colorado River Basin. Uh, then we have uh, water up on Sand Creek that brings water to the uh, North Fork of the Pooter River that is tributary to Sand Creek that is, uh, up in, goes up into Wyoming. To supplement Cashlapooter River water, Horsetooth Reservoir was constructed. It took two decades to build and fill the massive reservoir, which became operational in the 1950s and is still a major water supply for the Cashlapooter River Basin. 
it greened up North Larimer County quite a bit, it really did. It allowed uh, a lot better sugar beet area and a lot better cattle and sheep growing area. Over the period of time now, horse tooth has become a valuable source of water to the cities of uh, Fort Collins, uh, Greeley, and other entities to where now you see more of the uh, horse tooth water going to municipal use and less going to agricultural. As water management in the region became more and more complex, Larimer and Weld County's agricultural economy became a leading source of growth in the state. There were also technological advances that contributed to agricultural progress around the world, including one device called the partial flume. Without a way to accurately measure water flows, equitable regulation of water usage was nearly impossible until research along the Cache-Laputer produced the very technology that was needed. Professor Ralph Parshall of the Colorado Agricultural College, now known as Colorado State University, developed a revolutionary flume for measuring water. For the first time, agriculturists everywhere had a simple, inexpensive, and efficient method to precisely measure the flow of water. Colorado's growing economy in the first half of the 20th century was fueled in large part by the Cash Laputer Basin's burgeoning sugar beet industry and other economic developments resulting from the boom. The labor-intensive crop eventually caused farmers to bring in seasonal help. Migrant workers began flocking to the region. The beet would be thinned by hand. You'd plant twice as much seed as you needed because the storms would take some of it. And we used a lot of Mexican nationals. And they would leave as soon as the beets were laid by and, and they were canopied the ground so no more weeds would come up. They were very happy to be here. They were good workers and most of them didn't want to go home. Byproducts of the beet farming also led to other thriving industries. We had the refuge left over, the beet tops as we referred to them, and when they harvest the beets, they left the beet tops in the field. So those various crops were a perfect uh, uh, feedstock for lambs. It became really, the, it was recognized nationwide as kind of the sheep feeding capital. And farmers continued to thrive on other crops as well. He planted cabbage, lots of onions, carrots, turnips, parsnips, tomatoes, celery, oh, and Hubbard squash. He sold those vegetables. In the winter, the river produced a different kind of cash crop. My other granddad on my mother's side, they used to live up the Pooter in the 20s, and he had a Model T that he'd taken the rear wheels off and put saw blades on it. And then he'd hook a team to them, and he'd back the, the old Model T out in the river and then hook the team to it and start it up, and it'd cut the ice, and the horses would pull it across, then they could chop that ice up and bring it down to the ice house in Fort Collins. In the latter part of the 20th century, populations in the river basin dramatically increased, and the agricultural way of life that had prevailed for generations began to give way to urban development. As the urban encroachment came in, the dogs become a big problem for the sheep, so we kind of had to get out of that business. There's very little left here anymore. Today, homes and shopping centers fill the landscape where farms fed by the river once thrived. City dwellers and recreational users now share the bounty of the Cash Laputer as waters continue to flow freely through the region the way they did over a century ago. I do kind of hope that, that the people of today would be as appreciative of the next generations as our forefathers were. It was an innovative spirit that spurred the building of the region's water delivery system, and it was community spirit that helped develop the water law now used throughout the West. That first dispute between the Union Colony and Fort Collins set the groundwork for the basic system of prior appropriation based on the simple concept of first in time, first in right. The first person that went to water court and got a decree, that's the senior water right. The people that came in behind him and got water court decrees then become junior to him. 
This doctrine, along with concepts of beneficial use, abandonment, rights of reservoir users, transbasin diversions, and interstate issues all germinated along the fertile banks of this small but historic river. I think it's important that, that uh, the world remembers who built all the diversions and why the river has made this area as lush as it is. If you travel, even the Greeley area, or the Wellington area, Timnath, uh, every place you see trees, there's a, a part of the river. The Cache La Poudre National Heritage Area is a living monument to a river that made northern Colorado's Weld and Larimer counties what they are today. I think my ancestors would, and my great-grandfather particularly, would be pleased that I was able to carry on the, the work and the development of this river and the telling of the story. As far as the Poudre River is concerned, you know, we can't hardly emphasize enough what this river has done. For We simply would not, we would not have agriculture here without the Poudre River. So that's what's gave us our landscape, that's what's give us our way of life.